everyone dog walker here today we're going on the road to visit my friends at pro health chiropractic northwest calgary kevin and amanda are going to show us a few tips and tricks today hopefully you uh learn something from these guys they are the best hello everyone dog walker Dave here. Welcome back to the channel. Today I brought my show on the road to Pro Health Chiropractic. First of all, thank you to Kamal and the entire gang at Pro Health for letting us in here and filming this. Today we have Kevin. Kevin is a physiotherapist here at, at Pro Health and he's worked on me and my family numerous times. And we also have Amanda. Amanda's one of the ladies at the front who basically run the entire operation. <laughs> so I'm gonna close my mouth and I'm gonna let Kevin and Amanda, take over. Hello fans of Dog Walker Dave here. Uh, today we're going to be working on just a couple exercises that would be beneficial from what I've seen for runners and hikers. Um, a lot of these exercises ultimately take actually a look at the hip, core stability, as well as uh, hip mobility. So stability, mobility, and core strengthening. And then progressive loading. Now. Um, I guess some of the stuff that we're going to be doing today, um, I'll try and explain the importance of it um, and why we do it. Um, but we'll kind of get started with the first thing that I see a lot of is hip weakness. Um, the first thing with hip weakness is oftentimes when you see runners or hikers, we tend to see a bit of a hip drop. And you can actually go into the grocery store and you can watch people walking and you can actually see that sometimes when people walk they will have a hip drop and it's usually when you're walking the leg that you stand on the hip will drop on the opposite side and they call that a trendelenburg gait um, so what that takes a look at is typically it's looking at hip weakness on the same side and that's looking at what's called the glute med muscle Essentially, the glute med muscle attaches from the bump on the side of your hip almost to the dimple of your low back and sits in the crest of your hip. So basically, a lot of these exercises we're trying to make sure that we feel through that side there. Okay. Um, what we're going to be doing first is we're going to be looking at the three movements of the hip flex, or sorry, the uh, glute med, which is going to be looking at hip external rotation. Um, we're going to be looking at hip abduction, and we're also looking at controlling the hip drop, so trying to make sure that the hip actually comes up. So, uh, what we're going to be doing first with Amanda is I'll have Amanda standing right here for me, facing the mirror actually, so we can see from the back. You can use a balance stick as well. So you're going to put your left foot on the step right here, and what we're going to be watching here is we're going to make sure that she controls through her hip drop. So what we're going to be doing is she's going to be dropping her hip and then coming back up nice and high and coming back down and then back up. And what ideally the goal is is that she's going to be feeling the strengthening of her hip right here as well as making sure that she doesn't feel the back um, working right here because it's the idea of using the hip to strengthen and lift the hip up rather than using the low back as a um, as I guess the muscle to contract um, but yeah, that's exercise one here. Uh, the second exercise that we can take a look at is doing what's called a side-lying hip abduction. So what you're gonna be doing for me here, Amanda, is you're gonna lie on your side for me, okay? And what you're doing here for me is I tell people to be thinking about straightening out the top leg here. Um, from here, we're gonna be pointing the hip down towards the ground. For my gentlemen, I tell them to imagine that they're peeing on the floor and your toe is being pointed down, okay? So again, the ball on the side of your hip there, the dimple of your low back, if you draw a diagonal line, it's the upper quadrant right here that we wanna be feeling it in. And so Amanda's just going to raise her leg up and back down, okay? If she were to roll her hips backwards, what's going to happen is she's going to feel it actually in her hip flexor, which we don't want. So making sure the hips are pointed forward. So I'll have Amanda do a quick 10 for me. Okay. Perfect, how's that feeling? Burn. Burn, perfect, <laughs> where? This area. Perfect, yep. Yeah. So the next exercise we're gonna be doing is called a clamshell. So you can put that around your feet and up to your knees. And that's working on controlling the external rotation of your hip. So we're looking at controlling the external rotation of the hip. Again, it's the same muscle group that we're trying to work on. So uh, essentially we have the mouth of a clam, which would be right here. And again, we're going to make sure that a man doesn't rotate through her back 
because we want to make sure that that movement is coming from here. So she's going to open and close the mouth of her clam, fixated at these two points. And again, she should be feeling the burn in the same spot again. Okay? And we'll have Amanda do another quick 10 of those guys. Now the question is, how many repetitions should we actually be doing of some of these exercises? And I typically tell my clients that, you know, we want to make sure that you can do it first of all, and that they are fairly easy to do. Um, but we always think about the activity that we're trying to prepare for. So if we're trying to do uh, a run or a hike, typically you're looking at endurance, um, and you're trying to make sure that these muscles are capable of um, staying strong for a long period of time. So sometimes I tell clients, you know, the classic idea of, oh, let's do 10 repetitions of everything. Um, almost for these activities and for what the goal of running and hiking are, sometimes it will be actually inappropriate. So you're actually thinking about slowly increasing the amount to actually train the endurance of the muscle. So I usually tell clients to try and start with 10 and make sure that you can do it properly, but I'm actually working up to 20, 30, 40, 50 repetitions. And if you can do three sets of 50 repetitions without there actually being too much pain or discomfort, and it just feels like a good muscle burn, that'll be a really good point to um, basically tell you that you have good hip strengthening, okay? The second piece is looking at some of the uh, muscles that will tighten up with a lot of running and hiking. And with that, you'll find a lot of anterior chain tightening, okay? So you're looking at potentially quad tightness, and sometimes people will feel hip flexor tightness, okay? So with some of these pieces, especially with quad and hip flexor tightness, we find that it's with that repetitive loading, you're just putting a lot of strain through some of those areas. So we wanna make sure that we keep everything in a nice um, elongated position. So Amanda, I'll have you stand right here so that everyone can kind of see that ideal position. So we wanna make sure our back, our hip, and our knee are all in one straight line. So this is our normal standing posture, and what I'm going to have Amanda do for me is she can use this to balance, but with this uh, arm, she's going to pull her heel towards her butt. Okay, now what we can see with Amanda is as she did that, she arched her back a little bit more, so I wanna make sure she tucks her tummy back. Now you can see that her quad actually stays a little bit forward in front of her body. So Amanda might have a little bit of hip uh, and quad tightness. So we wanna make sure that she um, ideally would be in a straight line here and a straight line here, so everything would be in a straight line. Um, once you can get your heel to your bum as high as you possibly can, or as high as you possibly can, uh, Amanda's just going to squeeze her butt cheeks together as well, and when she squeezes her butt cheeks, that will help tilt the pelvis and keep everything in a little bit more uh, alignment, and that's also going to give her a deeper stretch. So again, you hold that for 15-30 seconds, just trying to get that muscle uh, nice and loose. Okay. From there, we're taking a look at the hip flexor mobility. And when we're looking at hip flexor mobility, we're thinking about the main muscles of what's called the iliopsoas. Now, the iliopsoas group um, basically will sit on the crest of the hips. So if you feel your hips on the top here, you're imagining that there's a bowl that one muscle called your iliacus will sit into, and the other one is called your psoas. And the psoas actually attaches onto the spine itself and comes forward, blends into the tendon of the iliacus, and together they attach onto the femur. So those two groups together are called the iliopsoas, and so we want to be thinking about a way to pull those pieces as far as possible, okay? So I like to typically go into just like a simple lunge position. Perfect, yep. So yeah, in the simple lunge position, Amanda basically is going to again think about squeezing her butt cheeks together, and when you squeeze your butt cheeks together, you're almost tilting your pelvis backwards. From there, I already feel a stretch into my hip, and I don't know if Amanda does as well, but if you don't, then you can simply drop into a little bit more of a lunge, keeping that butt squeezed, your abs tight, keeping that good alignment, and you should be feeling a nice stretch in through here. Now you can also think that because it's attaching off the spine and down through the femur, you can do a couple other things to increase mobility. Some of those things are going to be leaning over to one side. So if Amanda leans over this way, she can get a little bit more of a stretch, or sometimes rotation as well. So you can try and rotate away, to get a bit of a deeper stretch, or a combination of both, so she can rotate and lean at the same time to really open up that space. Okay? Uh, the next one we're gonna take a look at is just core strength. So when we're looking at core strength, we're thinking about, um, same idea here is that sometimes because of the tightness or potentially the weakness of the core, the hip flexor can actually work as a stabilizer of the spine. And we don't want the hip flexor to work as a stabilizer for the spine. We want the core to work as a stabilizer for the spine. 
So sometimes people will have low back tightness, and sometimes that's more due to the fact that as the hip flexor gets tighter and tighter, it starts to pull our hips into an anterior drop, and that starts to put our back into a bit of extra extension. So by increasing core strength and glute strength, we can kind of pull that back into a neutral spine, okay? Um, it's very common that sometimes you'll find runners and hikers, especially as they're going up hills, um, that they will start feeling a little bit of loading and pain into their low back. So to address some of that, we're going to work on our core. The main one that I start people with is a plank. So I'm going to have Amanda get into a plank position on her elbows and her feet. In this position, she's going to squeeze two main things for me, but we're first going to watch her posture. So we don't want a curve in the spine. We want it to be nice and flat, and the shoulders should be gently squeezed up top. From here, we should be squeezing the butt cheeks together again, and we're squeezing the abs. And if you're connecting those two pieces, again, you're trying to create that neutral spine. If you feel any pain in the low back, try and squeeze your butt more, try and squeeze your abs more, or try to watch where the position of that, of your, um, I guess, your low, or you're trying to see the position <laughs> of your spine, making sure that it is nice and flat. If that is difficult to do, you can also drop on the knees, which is pretty good to do as well, just as a starting point. And if you do have any low back pain, um, the idea is to stop, because if you're doing the exercise wrong, then you're going to cause more injury, potentially. Okay. Uh, the last piece of this is just thinking about the idea of progressive loading and whether we're loading the muscles, we're loading the tendons, we want to be thinking that, you know, if you're a runner and you, um, your goal is to run a marathon, you're not going to go from the couch to running a marathon in one day. You have to properly uh, train the muscles, the tendons, the joints to be able to withstand that load. And part of that is training like that as well. So as far as strength training for the knees and the hips, sometimes I take a look at starting with a drop squat. And what the drop squat is, essentially we're going to be thinking about uh, dropping and catching ourselves at the bottom of a squat. And from there, you're actually getting that elastic uh, recoil of not only the muscle, but mainly the tendons. So we're trying to teach the tendons how to uh, activate their stretch reflex, okay? Um, I tell most of my clients to start with about three sets of 20 with body weight and making sure that it doesn't bother the knees or the hips when they're doing this. If they can do three sets of 20 with no pain or discomfort, then I usually have them start loading it with a dumbbell in front of them or holding it by their sides until they can do about 20 pounds in either hand. And if they can do that also, you can also try it single leg. Now when you're doing it single leg, you want to be watching to make sure that the hip, knee, and ankle are all in one straight line, right? You want to make sure that the hip is not dropping on the opposite side because that's what we're trying to address in the first exercise there. So Amanda's just going to drop her knee down and again, making sure her hip, knee, and ankle stay in one straight line. She can even do a little bit of external rotation with her knee. Oh, me. Yeah. Perfect. So that we keep that alignment. Perfect. Perfect. And we're just looking at a quick drop and catch and coming back up. Because if you're imagining running, you have a series of basically mini drops in your knee. Okay. And the last piece is when we're looking at uh, either running or hiking up and down hills, we're thinking about an element of, I guess, a mini squat, but also controlling everything that we talked about. So the hip, knee, ankle all want to be in one straight line. You're not getting any hip drop, and you're active through your core and your butt. So when we're looking at the step up, we're thinking that uh, Amanda's going to take a step up. From here, she's going to be driving through the hip. So ideally, she's activating through her hip on this side, trying to push up on that leg, keeping her hip, knee, and ankle on one straight line and not letting it dip in or out too far. And also, when she is coming up, she wants to see that her hips are also level and that she's not dropping down or doing something funny with her hip. She can also do the same thing controlling as she's stepping down, which a lot of people typically have anterior knee pain or tendonitis type pain around their knee. And what you want to be watching for again is shuffle right up to the edge there. And again, we can watch the hips here as she's stepping down and make sure that you can see on that one, her hip on her left side drop down. So I want Amanda to imagine activating that hip, keeping the hip up as she steps down. And the other thing is hip, knee, ankle stays on one straight line and keeping the core nice and strong as she's doing that. Okay. So those are just a couple ideas of what we can start with for uh, exercises for people that are wanting to get into running, hiking, or people that are trying to engage, or I guess like um, gain more from their training from dryland, from a dryland standpoint. 
Um, other things that you can think about doing, more core exercise, more hip strengthening, um, anything that crosses the knee joint, so quads, hamstrings, calves, should all be fairly strong as well. But uh, that's basically uh, what I got for you guys today. Uh, Dave? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, most times it's better to go to a professional to get all of these little tips and tricks than just to go to someone like myself because these guys know definitely what they're doing. I want to thank Kevin and Amanda very much for coming to help me out with this. Socially distance high five from here. Have a great rest of your night, everyone. Peace.